Attempting to understand the complex behaviors and uniqueness of a person with autism can be somewhat of a mystery. For someone who was born under the autism spectrum, many people throughout my life would ask me questions like, why do you spell in the air? What's with the gestures? Why are you whispering? What is it that you're drawing? Then there were the questions from my parents. When did you know he had autism? What is his special talent? Do you think he'll be able to live on his own? The rate of autism in 1996, my birth year, was 1 in 125 kids. Today, it has risen to 1 in 54 and boys are still four times more likely to have autism than girls. Memories of my childhood are limited, and I have to rely on my family to fill them in for me. The first memory I have is after I turned two. This was when my parents realized that I wasn't like my older brothers. I didn't seem to require as much sleep as the other kids, and I needed to be hugged firmly and wrapped tightly in blankets to fall asleep. They found out that keeping me on a schedule and maintaining a predictable routine worked the best. Schedules and routines continue to be guiding factors in my daily life, whether it involves work or school, mealtime, going to the gym, and even my hobbies. Structure and order just make sense. Explaining why someone acts or reacts in a certain way can be difficult, and certainly all people with autism aren't the same. Being a spectrum disorder, the effects have a wide range of impact on a person's ability to function. I was labeled as high-functioning, which in clinical terms meant that I was at or above average intelligence. As an adult, I have been able to shed a little light on some of my past behaviors. Much of my frustration as a young boy stemmed from the inability of people around me to meet my needs. As a baby and toddler, I reached all the typical milestones earlier than expected. It was shortly after my second birthday when things changed. I lost the ability to communicate, I became nonverbal, aloof, and my parents thought I might have lost my hearing because I did not respond to any external stimuli. I was in my own world and I didn't really want anyone else in it. I began my fascination with letters around the age of two. I used the plastic refrigerator magnets to spell out words throughout my home. I didn't really play with toys in the manner they were intended. They were more like tools for me. Writing words seemed to calm and reassure me as I liked to spell words that I saw in my surroundings. I insisted that closed captioning was turned on for TV shows and movies. This preference proved beneficial in enhancing my ability to learn how to read. In fact, I was the only kid in preschool who could read, although it was never out loud, as I still struggled to speak. My childhood schedule featured pictures and words of each daily activity. I was given choices. These were designed to help me verbalize my wants and to help meet my needs. The schedule eliminated a lot of the frustration, fits, and tantrums I had been experiencing over being misunderstood. I learned to speak again and could communicate my needs to others by kindergarten, but from the age of two to six, I mainly used echolalia for my verbal expression. Echolalia is simply repeating words or sentences from other sources. For me, I used it even before I could generate words, in that I used gibberish. I would repeat lines from my favorite cartoons. The irony in this is that I learned to use the lines in answering questions and asking for things from the people in my life. Oftentimes, my responses generated laughter and proved to be an endearing quality that pleased others. I didn't really understand this phenomenon until later in my life. My echolalia became a bit of a problem for me as I grew older. Although I no longer used immediate responses, I employed delayed echolalia as sort of a way to soothe and comfort myself when I was bored or stressed. I had a few phrases that brought positive thoughts and mental images, so I would just say them whenever they popped into my head, to start a practice conversation, or whenever I needed a break from what was happening around me. 
One of my favorites was Bobcat Kittens. I would say it out loud, and my mom would answer, They're so cute. This was reassuring and made me happy. However, I learned over time that just spouting off random words and phrases was not socially appropriate, and I had to alter that behavior. At first, I changed it to a whisper, but found that others still viewed this as strange in a social setting, particularly in middle and high school. The next most logical alteration in this behavior made so much sense to me. Drawing on my past and my fascinations with letters and fonts, I decided to spell familiar phrases in the air. I could meet my needs quietly and without drawing unwanted attention. About the time I learned to spell in the air, I also began drawing. I discovered that I could sketch characters who could say the things I was thinking and was able to reassure myself without involving others. Perhaps it was this revelation that drew me into studying the art world. It's hard for me to see myself as a nonverbal child. I am grateful for the people in my life. They give me room to develop self-expression and find my way through their world. I have a feeling that words in the air will always bring me comfort and happiness.